Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Welcome to the University of New Mexico Grand Rounds program. Today, we are quite honored to have our, our own Dr. Bustillo join us. And it is a pleasure for me to get to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Juan Bustillo, uh, who will be talking to us about psychodynamics, psychopharmacology, and its application to serious mental illness. A bit about our colleague here, Dr. Bustillo, uh, join the Department of Psychiatry. All right. Should I start? No, no. At the university. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm introducing you. Can you hear me okay? Hello. Can you hear us, Juan? The connection is not great after I disconnected it. Uh, we hear on. you and see you. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I'm just going to finish introducing you. Is that good? Yes. Okay, so Dr. Bastillo joined the Department of Psychiatry at UNM in 1996 after completing a three-year schizophrenia research fellowship at the University of Maryland. He's a clinician scientist devoted to caring for patients with serious mental illness. In 2008, he received the Exemplary Psychiatrist Award for the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and he has also received several NIH and Foundation Extramural Awards to study the interface between brain chemistry and pharmacology of schizophrenia. He has over 150 peer-reviewed publication has, and has contribution to the field of schizophrenia psychopathology was acknowledged by his appointment to the American Psychiatric yeah, Association yeah, Association's Hello? DSM-5 work group on psychotic disorders from 2007 through 2012. He is a member of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and in 2014 was chair of the NIH Interventions Committee for Adult Disorder Study Section. In 2018, he was awarded the American Psychiatric Association Simon Bolivar Award for outstanding contributions to education, research, and overall achievement in psychiatry. In his 28 years at UNM, he has provided continuous care to some of the sickest patients in Albuquerque, and he has also long been recognized as one of our greatest teachers and has trained decades of psychiatric residents, both in the treatment of serious medical illness and also in how to spend time and connect with our patients in the most caring and careful of ways. Dr. Bastillo, thank you for joining us. I turn to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I hope I don't have problems with this connection. Anyway, so I'm going to be talking about something that may sound sort of like an oxymoron for many of you psychodynamic psychopharmacology. When I heard, first heard about that, eh, I thought, well, what is this? This doesn't make any sense um, because these two terms seem like they go against each other. And I'm going to be talking about how this, this is applied to serious mental illness. And I these are my conflicts. And the question that I'm trying to, I hope that I can address for you today is, should a prescribing psychiatrist go beyond um, assessing symptoms, side effects, and function in the standard 20 or 30 minute interview that takes place every one or three months? And my answer to this question is gonna be yes. And I hope I can persuade you to consider this, um, this proposition seriously. So this is an overview. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about history. Uh, I'm going to be talking about interviewing and ab about psychodynamic psychopharmacology, specifically for serious mental illness, give some clinical examples. And I hope I can finish in 45 minutes so we have time for questions and comments. So a little bit about history. Psychiatry. Modern psychiatry originates from, true, from two traditions. Uh, and these traditions remarkably uh, uh, developed in the same area of the world at around the same time. Uh, from Central Europe uh, at the turn of the last century. And they were led by Emil Kreplin and Sigmund Freud. Uh, one from Germany with the other one from Austria. Uh, Kreplin, both physicians. A, a Kreplin more interested initially in experimental psychology, and Kreplin a, and Freud was trained actually as an analyst, as a, as a neurologist, and they both made their mark with these classic 
textbooks. Uh, in the case of Kriplin, uh, what he uh, accomplished was to, based on careful description, descriptive psychopathology, to differentiate the insanities into dementia precox and manic depressive illness. And he did this by observing very seriously ill people from where they were very young in the asylum for many, many years. Freud, as a neurologist, he actually had a private practice and that's where he saw his patients. And his patients were very different from Kreplin's. Uh, these, this was in Vienna, a very cosmopolitan society, uh, for the most part, upper middle, middle class patients with um, less serious symptoms. And he, he really developed the concept of hysteria as the prototype for an illness that is thought to be caused by a underlying unconscious psychological conflicts. So these two approaches to psychiatry differed significantly and they develop in parallel. Kreplin and Freud actually never met, which is remarkable. Um, the descriptive model, you know, exemplified by Kreplin and the um, psychodynamic model focused on symptoms and the, fee the meaning of the symptoms. And the question that, that uh, to me is so incre intriguing is whether this origin of these two parallel uh, approaches poses a built-in conflict for psychiatric providers that we're still dealing with. All right. Um, so now um, let's talk a little bit about how we make diagnosis in psychiatry and, and, and the options reflect these two traditions in my view. So you have on the left, the kind of information that we need to collect in, in psychiatry to make a diagnosis. And diagnosis of course is critical because diagnosis tells us something about what's gonna happen with a patient. In psychiatry in particular, we have to rely almost entirely on collecting information from our interview with the patient and getting collateral information too. And, and, and we rely on this because as you all know, we don't have any tests. We don't have any that, uh, you know, clearly reliable, valid biological or psychological tests to make any of our psychiatric diagnosis. So how do we go about getting the best information? In the medical approach, we pay a lot of time, effort to collecting the, the description of symptoms. Hopefully the symptoms coalesce into a syndrome like we're used to in medicine. And we make a syndromatic diagnosis and that tells us something about the prognosis. There's another approach, which is the life history approach, in which, in which we're really more interested in events, relationships, and meaning of symptoms. In the medical approach, we start with a question like, why are you here? And the patient will say something, well, because they, my parents, they don't believe that the FBI has implanted a chip in my brain to follow me. And then you'll get uh, the rest of the information following this particular order. In the life history approach, you will ask with a question, much more broader question, like, tell me about yourself. And you can get an answer like, uh, initially the patient may say, well, I don't know, what do you mean? And then you can narrow the question a little bit and you can say, well, tell me about your background. And the patient would say, well, you know, I'm a Mexican American and I'm married and I don't know what else to tell you. And then you can narrow it a little bit more and you can say, well, tell me where you grew up. What was it like for you with your family? Things like that. And what you hope is that the patient will give you a narrative and you collect the same information that you need. And remember, you want the most valid information. We rely upon this information to make our diagnosis. But they give you the information in the opposite direction. 
and and they will tell you yes uh, you know i grew up in the south valley and i remember it was tough at home and my father left when i was five years old and they will keep telling you and you will encourage the patient to go on and on using their own words now you will still be ready to ask questions critical questions to make sure that you are getting the most valid information. So there are things that are critical. So you may say something like, uh, well, you've mentioned your mom, you've mentioned your siblings, you really haven't mentioned your dad. Tell me about your dad, yeah? Or uh, you've mentioned going to school and how you didn't like school and you just moved uh, um, along that, but tell me, in school where you bullied, things like that. Now, you still need to get the rest of the information, okay? So how do these two approaches uh, compare in, in other senses? Well, some generalizations, uh, we tend to be more comfortable with the medical approach in some settings, like the inpatient setting, the consultation liaison setting, perhaps, the, the psychiatric emergency setting, the life history approach, maybe more in the outpatient setting, uh, you, you won't be surprised that the life history approach takes a little bit longer. It may be more difficult to develop the skills to get comfortable using that approach. A caricature of the life history approach is, of course, the patient laying on a couch, free associating, and we don't use that anymore. We don't believe we can get really valid information from that, although it can be very helpful in a specific setting of specific type of psychotherapy, the caricature of the medical approach is a checklist. So at uh, most of our psychiatric pa patients, we don't give them a checklist and tell them, you know, just tell me when your symptoms started and what has helped and wasn't helped. And one thing that I will submit to you, and I hope that I can persuade you, is that with the life history approach, not only we have a better chance of developing a therapeutic alliance with the patient. Hey, Juan, can, can you hear me? schizophrenia. These are highly comorbid disorders. One critical uh, issue. Are you hearing me, Jeff? Yeah, you cut out there just for about 20 yeah. seconds. So one critical issue about serious mental illness is the poor compliance with treatment that is built into some of the most serious mental illness like psychotic disorders. And this is from a recent study from Finland, and it's, I, I picked it because it's one of the largest studies, three, over 3,000 patients with first episode psychosis who were followed. And in Finland, there's socialized medicine, so everybody gets all the services. And you see that after the first year, the rate of discontinuation is already 30%, discontinuation of medicine. And in the following eight years, patients in average have discontinued medication six, six times. So it's a huge problem. Now, in the United States, the standard of care for first episode psychosis and in general for psychotic disorder has stemmed from the RACE study. And I'm not gonna explain the results of the RACE study. It, we're fortunate that our, our um, uh, Albuquerque was represented and uh, uh, by one of our own, Steve Lewis was the uh, head of the RACE study and that set us up, fortunately with our early clinic that took on everything that we learned from the race study here in Albuquerque, and we're still using it. But the race approach, which I believe it's the standard of care, involves a multi-modal approach that provides wraparound services for the patient with first episode psychosis. And you have all these providers involved, and we have this uh, here uh, at the university. Now, let me just highlight what, what is said about the prescriber. Yeah, the prescriber includes the psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. And the prescriber, their function is to diagnose, prescribe, monitor symptoms, and monitor side effects. That's it. 
Why a complementary approach to race? Well, first of all, compliance is a huge problem, even with race. The other thing is psychiatrists used to prescribe and do supportive psychotherapy. You know, when I trained 35 years ago, that was the expectation, even for people with serious mental illness. I've noticed that that has changed. You know, I've been here 27 years and I've noticed that less and less of a, often the residents, unless the patient is specifically defined that the patient is seeing you for individual psychotherapy, the residents less and less often engage in what I would call general supportive psychotherapy. This may be because of pressure from coders, uh, insurance companies, and some administrators with a narrow view of what it means to work at the top of your license. And that may be that the psychiatrist is just a prescriber. So I believe skills are being lost. This is probably not good for patients. And what I'm gonna be talking to you about is not really based on data. It's based on my experience here. And it's probably uh, not great for the psychiatrist either. Yeah, because it may lead to burnout, seeing yourself as just someone who prescribes and that's it. Now, on the other side, psychiatrists, I believe, have a great advantage as uh, in terms of the role for serious mental illness. First of all, re remember, there's no proof of a diagnosis. The diagnosis is completely clinical. So that poses a huge problem for people, for all patients, but especially for patients with serious mental illness and psychotic disorders. The other advantage is the psychiatrist is the expert in what medicine does in terms of benefits and side effects and what it doesn't do. So the psychiatrist as a diagnostician prescriber, I believe is in the best position to address insight and compliance, which are critical for patients with serious mental illness. However, my position is that the psychiatrist must be comfortable addressing the meaning for the patients of at least five issues. The meaning of the symptoms, the meaning of the diagnosis, the meaning of seeing a provider, the meaning of taking psychiatric medication, and the meaning of getting better. And this, lead, this leads us to the concept of psychodynamic psychopharmacology that was developed in Austin Riggs. And the, the core concept is that how you prescribe probably matters as, as much as what you prescribe. And it, it all comes from this small book uh, that I read uh, over the last couple of years, Dr. Uh, uh, Aziz Al-Bawab and Dr. Jeff Katzman recommended the book to me. Book was, uh, uh, the author is David Mintz. I highly recommend this book for all of you prescribers. Uh, it's only 250 pages. And this book, I believe, was developed as a complementary model to the full therapeutic model proposed by Austin Riggs. The full model has a limitation is that it, it's, it's very expensive, yeah? Um, but I believe that this psychodynamic psychopharmacology model can be applied and should be applied by most psychiatrists and other prescribing clinicians to most of their patients in their usual setting of, you know, every two or three months medication check visits. All right, so the, so, psycho, so, so this model is based on the, on the belief, and there's, there's a lot of evidence for this, that psychosocial factors have a major impact on medication response. And there's some obvious easy uh, factors, funding, Patient doesn't have the money, they can't get the medicine. Compliance, the patient doesn't take the medicine. And then sort of deeper factors related to the expectations and meaning that treatment has for the patients. And we need to embrace as prescribers, as psychiatrists, looking into this with the patient. So there are expectations. The patient may have expectations. This medicine is going to make me like a zombie. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to take this. 
There's other meanings. The overall social meaning of stigma is huge for psychiatry and for psychiatric medications. There's an easier kind of meaning, sort of more at the surface meaning, like I don't want to become dependent. I can do this on my own. There's deeper meanings, like sec secondary gain. For example, a patient who, this is not that common, a patient who's delusional and is bothered by her delusions, but in a sense is also comfort comforted by implications from the delusions, that there's this all whole, other universe of beings and situations that are comforting. And so in psychiatric psychopharmacology, the bread and butter of what we're gonna be dealing with in terms of understanding meaning are items three, four, five, and six. Then there's a potential deeper meaning that, that uh, Mintz uh, describes, and it's the primary game, the so-called primary game of symptoms. And this comes from the psychoanalytic view that symptoms are really just uh, red herrings that but that are linked to an inner intrapsychic unconscious conflict which is the origin of the mental illness and you know there is very little evidence certainly for psychotic disorder that this is the case that psychotic disorders stem from this kind of unconscious primary conflict. I mean, actually, most of the evidence does not support this. But apart from that, the fact is that the approach of deeply looking into meaning, into deep meanings in psychotic disorders, specifically in schizophrenia, has been tested. So you don't need to memorize this. This is the Boston Psychotherapy Study for schizophrenia. It was done in the 80s. The lead author is Gunderson. I highly recommend looking at it. It was funded by NIMH. Large study of patients with schizophrenia who were already stabilized on antipsychotics. And as outpatients, they were randomly assigned to be treated with intensive exploratory insight-oriented therapy, three hours a week, done by expert analysts in Boston versus a group randomly assigned to just one hour a week, reality adaptive supportive therapy by a counselor or social worker. And the bottom line is that there was no advantage for the experimental uh, uh, treatment. So you don't need to feel like you're depriving at least your schizophrenic patients from something uh, if you don't refer them sort of, or you're not trying to do deep uh, analytically based therapy. Okay. So psychodynamic psychopharmacology for serious mental illness. First, you need to go with an open mind and assume that the assumption, let me backtrack, the assumption that symptoms are meaningless, that they are just a random electrical discharge from the brain is a mistake. I'm not going to get deeper into that. I mean, in the, at the end of the, of the presentation, we can talk about that. But that assumption is a mistake. How deep to pursue the meaning in our regular setting, every three months visits with our patients with serious mental illness should be pragmatic. First, what is overtly important to the patient and the loved ones? But second, what is available in terms of resources? Resources in terms of your time and the patient's time and your knowledge, your level of comfort. What you should not do is overpromise something that you cannot deliver. Yeah. Now, you you have to be open for to the patient talking about whatever they want, even if you're going to try to focus mostly on the meaning of the symptoms, the illness, and the treatment. So, the in terms of the initial visit. What is critical is to develop and set the stage of appropriate boundaries. Again, I'm talking about just regular medication checkup uh, for patients with serious mental illness. And the bottom line is that in the first few sessions, what is absolutely the most important thing is to establish the basis for a therapeutic alliance with the patient. And I tell this to the residents in their third year when they come to the COPE clinic and they have an hour and a half to see the patient for the first time. 
don't worry about crossing all the T's and you know getting every single bit of information. What is most important is how you present to the patient and to convey to the patient that you are there together and you're going to help him if he or she allows it to better understand what they've been going through. That is the most important thing. Next comes making a diagnosis. So how do we go about this? Uh-oh, uh hold on. So critical. Do not close on a diagnosis just based on collateral. And collateral includes just what's written in the chart. You do not want to do that. You don't want to say, well, your diagnosis is schizophrenia, so we're going to talk about that. Or even if the patient comes and says, well, I have schizophrenia, and that's what I want to talk about. You want to keep an open mind, com convey to the patient that you want to understand him as a person. And as part of that, you want to understand whatever dysfunctional problem or uh, a, a painful process that they're having. However, you need to explain the need for collateral. Again, you want the best, the most valid information. The manner of communicating in the first visit sets the stage for a therapeutic alliance. You want to communicate that you truly value the patient's autonomy. What's tricky with patients with serious mental illness is that you have to be aboard about the possibility of loss of autonomy from the beginning, calling, uh, getting the patient uh, to the emergency room for, through a certificate of evaluation, applying for guardianship. So this is trickier. And these are things that are really not explored in Mint's book, understandably, because he's dealing with a different population. Do not infantilize the patients. When the patient comes and says, oh, call me Joe, everybody calls me Joe. I, the residents hear me say this all the time. I will tell the patient, Mr. Smith, I address all my adult patients by their last name, okay? And uh, if the patient says, no, but the nurse, your nurse just call me Joe and my last doctor called me, call me Joe, then you wanna say something like, and what was that like for you with your last doctor? Well, how, how do how, what was that like for you? And then that becomes a, 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 an issue that you can explore with the patient about to what extent they fear that you may not be caring enough for them, for example, if you don't uh, go along with uh, using um, their first name. Privacy is critical and it's related to not infantilizing the patients. See the patient alone. I always tell the rest to see the patient alone. Yeah. And you will find patients who will walk into your office with mom and he'll say, No, I want mom to be present. I want her to see me. And I will tell them, Tell, tell the patient, Mr. Smith, I understand what, that you want your mom present. I see all my patients, my adult patients, by themselves initially. We're going to meet, and if you still want for us, your mom to join us, I'll leave time and we'll call her in. You need to be prepared to do that. And that there's exceptions, obviously, uh, that uh, about seeing the patient alone. You may not be able to do that when you're concerned about your safety. Set the office so that you have similar chairs, plenty of space between the both of you and the patient. Why? Because you want to get comfortable looking at the patient face to face for 30 or 45 minutes or an hour. Yes, even in a medication check. Now, you need to feel safe. Obviously, you need to have enough space. Do not see the patient behind a desk. I recommend no handshaking and no hugging. Yeah. Um, there are exceptions, for example, when ending treatment, uh, and you may say, well, what's wrong with handshaking? And for many patients, there's nothing wrong. But I find it helpful to set the stage because you will find patients who, who want to hold your hand after you shake hands, and then they want to hug. And then they complain that, well, you know, I'm going through this crisis, and now you don't care about me. I mean, and you hug me once, and why wouldn't you hug me now when, when I'm really needing you? Okay, 
focus on the patient. I do not take notes. I certainly don't recommend, I advise strongly about, against typing in the room while you're interviewing the patient. Put yourself in the patient's shoes. If you went to see a psychiatrist and you're nervous and the psychiatrist is typing while you're talking to them, you may not feel great about that. Um, the patient should be doing most of the talking during every interview. There are exceptions. The patient is very disorganized. The patient is delirious. And by the end of the first interview, you should have an idea of what the rules of the game are going to be, what's called the frame. And you, so you should be able to tell the patient something about, you know, today we met for an hour and a half, but this was just for our first visit. From now on, our visits are going to be 45 minutes. Of those 45 minutes, I'm going to be with you for about 30 minutes, then I'm going to call my attending and da 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 So that it's a matter of respect and autonomy and setting up the stage for, for so that the patient, you and the patient can have a good boundaries. How often you're going to meet? When is the last time that you're likely to see the patient? That is absolutely cri critical. That should be up front. I am, uh, the latest that I'm going to see you is the end of June. If you know, now, so now we progress into the first interview. And like I said, what I recommend is the life history approach. So you wanna start learning about this person, not just their symptoms. And this, you also wanna learn about the symptoms, but the symptoms will, will uh, emerge. The description of the symptoms will emerge in the context of the life history of the patient. That'll give you more confidence that when the patient is describing the symptoms, they are really describing critical psychopathology. So you'll get a chronology of life events and you're looking for a chronology of relationships, achievements, challenges, losses, trauma, and that should take, take, take the patient to current relationships, role functioning, romantic relationships. Now you wanna get a, the best possible idea about the symptoms, of course. Um, in general, checklist questions for symptoms do not work. So the residents hear me say this all the time. Do you hear voices? Terrible question to ask a patient with psychotic disorder, to ask anybody, yeah? It's one of the most stigmatizing questions, yeah? And if the patient says yes or no, many patients, you won't know if it's the truth or not. And once you've asked it and the patient says yes or no, you're basically closing the door. It's so once you establish from the patient one thing that they are truly distressed by, for example, patient is not sleeping and they feel anxious during the day, you can say, if the patient is not mentioning psychotic symptoms, you can say, you know, sometimes patients who are not sleeping and they're getting anxious, that affects how they think, even how they hear. Have you ever felt? after being very anxious and not sleeping, for example, or at other times that you're hearing someone whispering next to you and they whisper and whisper and you turn around, there's nobody there. Now, if the patient says, yes, it's like I'm hearing voices, then you can use that term. So when you're hearing voices and then you start asking about the boundaries of the symptoms, are these, are these voices like you hear my voice talking to you? Yeah. Um, or is it more like a memory? Or is it more like a thought? You ask questions about the context, the context in which the voices become more apparent, the pervasiveness about the voices. And you, you want to get a sense about the meaning. What is it like for you when you, whatever term the patient uses, yeah? When you feel like you have no privacy, when you feel like you're hearing voices, okay? And, and some patients will say, well, I feel like someone is repeating my thoughts out loud. And that is the terms, the, the term that you're going to use in other interviews when they come back and you say, well, how, how are your thoughts? I mean, what do you mean? Well, are you still feeling that people are repeating your thoughts out loud? Now, you're going to talk. So we've, we've heard, we've discussed how in the first interview you want to set the stage for good boundaries. You're going to 
get start the life history interview. You're going to talk about symptoms in the context of the life history. You're going to want to ask about providers, but not just, okay, who has treated you and where and what was his name? And no, you want to, what, what I tell residents, uh, and I try, try to model for them when I'm sitting with them in, in, in the COPE clinic is, I'll ask the patient, well, how long have you been coming to this clinic? And the patient will say, well, I don't know, but several years. So you must have seen different doctors. How, what, how has that been for you? And the patient will say, well, I don't know. I don't remember. There's been too many. Yeah. Tell me about your last doctor. Do you remember their name? What was it like? And it doesn't mean that you're going to side with the patient if the patient is criticizing the previous resident or not. But you're opening the door to the patient to talking about their previous doctor, their previous provider. And again, that sets the stage so they can talk in front of you about you. You're going to talk. Uh, Dr. Bustillo, I think you might be frozen again. Works. That's another pearl from Mintz. Don't assume that everything uh, that the patient is looking for is just for the symptoms to go away. Give to the patient choices. Remember uh, uh, autonomy. So if you're thinking about an antipsychotic, once you're ready to talk about medication, you can say, well, there's these groups of, anti of medications for this problem. They all work about the same, but some tend to have more weight gain, some tend to have more uh, motor side effects and give some choices. So the developing of the working alliance is the absolutely critical goal of the first several sessions in any kind of psychiatric interaction, inpatient, outpatient. Or for this, you have to be comfortable telling the truth to the patient, yeah? You are telling the truth to the patient. As you understand it, there are exceptions to the privacy and patient's choice. And you should tell them about that. You know, under which circumstances you would call someone else, under which circumstances you would fill a certificate of evaluation. There are circumstances, few, in which you won't tell the truth. Yeah, if you have someone on the phone and they're saying they're suicidal and the only way you can keep him on the phone longer, if the patient says, well, you're not going to call anybody, you're not going to call my mom, you may end up saying, yeah, I'm not going to call your mom and call, your, and call her mom. And you need, this is another pearl from Mintz, you need to uh, convey to the patient uh, that the door for communication about you is open. You need to tell me when I'm doing something that doesn't work for you. And finally, at the end of the first meeting and many meetings, how did this meeting work for you? Bringing it to the here and now. So now what are the differences and the similarities between Mintz's approach to psychiatric pharmacology, psychopharmacology, and our approach in serious mental illness? And there's really only two differences, two broad differences. Mintz emphasizes the placebo response says something, I mean, over and over in different ways, your medicine will work better if you lie, if you are in agreement uh, with your medicine, if you want to take it. And, and that may be fine for some populations. For, for patients with serious mental illness, especially patients with psychotic disorders who have very limited insight and poor compliance, I think the risks outweigh the benefits of emphasizing the placebo response. Because, you know, if you're saying as to someone who's psychotic and doesn't believe that they're ill and you're trying to persuade them to try an antipsychotic and you, the, from the onset, you're saying, well, there's 40% chance that this is going to be a placebo response. If the patient gets better, agrees to take it, they may say after three weeks, well, I really want to stop now. By the way, you know, there, there's a almost 50% chance that I got better just because it has nothing to do with the medicine. So emphasizing the placebo response, I would argue, is not an advantage to our patients with serious mental illness. And it's not something that we do 
in the rest of medicine in the treatment of patients with chronic medical problems. And this is related, of course, to compliance, like I mentioned. I mean, compli compliance and insight is very, very poor in patients with serious mental illness. The other difference is more conceptual. And in the Austin Riggs model, treatment resistance is really presumed to be as due to poor compliance or due to this hidden primary intrapsychic conflicts. So Mintz would say, well, you know, sometimes the patient is the psychosis is not getting better, even though you've tried all these medicines and they're taking it because deep, deep inside, there's that underlying intrapsychic conflict that fuels the psychosis. We don't, I don't believe that. Uh, and we fortunately for serious mental illness, we have empirically empirical ways of defining treatment resistance. So treatment resistance for someone with schizophrenia is you fail two antipsychotics as uh, the adequate dose. And then there's a clear indication. You try clozapine. And if they fail clozapine, there's a clear indication. There's ECT. Okay. So, so that's that's one of the one, one of the differences. Now, the rest, they're very similar. So you have to define the frame of the of the relationship up front we have you have to work constantly on keeping the boundaries you have to be empathetic to the patient okay doesn't mean holding hands doesn't mean hugging okay doesn't mean a, answering every question at any time of the day in between appointments and this allows you to address transference to address counter transference and to get to the meaning of medication and illness, but you have to be willing to talk about anything with the patient. So this is an example uh, of a patient. Uh, uh, hold on, I'm having trouble here. Okay, so you want to address the affect. So this is an example of a patient with schizophrenia, inpatient, irritable with referential thinking, yelling at staff, patient was seen daily for 10 minutes in a room, closed room, sitting four times. Patient comes and says, staff keeps saying stuff to put me down, but nobody listens to me. You feel like they're talking about you. Yes, it happens with other people too. I guess with my landlord and some neighbors, you mentioned an argument with him that led you to coming to the hospital. Stop psychoanalyzing me, he says, he's furious. The psychiatrist is a little bit uh, nervous, but then he says, I'm listening to you and you're raising your voice. We've talked about misinterpreting things. I guess I'm doing it now. So here you see an example, and this is the bread and butter of psychiatric psychopharmacology. You want to elicit a, a reaction, an emotional reaction to an interaction in the past, for example, a patient and their landlord, in the present, patient and staff, and in the room, patient and the psychiatrist. And this can be very, very powerful in allowing the patient to understand themselves. You have to address behavior, just like you have to address the affect. This is an example of a patient in PS. He, he was just asked by the resident if he has, was hearing voices, and he said no. You seem to be looking around the room, says uh, the psychiatrist. It's nothing, patient giggling to himself. Seems like you're trying to touch something. They are angels. Are they nice? Yeah, and they won't shut up. So this is an example that shows you how an open-ended approach to interviewing, but attuned interviewing, can address negative transference. It's schizophrenia, parent is a treatment guardian, and they're seen weekly for 30 minutes for about a month, a month since the patient had a relapse. Patient walks in the room. 
uh, walks in the room. I'm going to shoot you, says the patient. The, the psychiatrist is a little bit stricken. But then he looks at the patient. patient's wearing a mask. Psychiatrist says, you seem to be smiling. I can see it in your eyes. Yes. You were pretty mad last week. You said you wanted to kill your mom, dad, and me. And now you're saying it again. Should I be afraid? No, says the patient. You wanted me to call adult protective services. And then the patient yells, my mom mistreated me. Nobody gets, gives an F. And you feel that I, cannot, I don't care about you either. And this was, this was helpful to the patient sort of to calm down. Sometimes you address positive transference. So this is a patient with schizophrenia followed for years, every three months for 30 minutes. And he walks in and he says, you're the best doctor in all of New Mexico. You feel your treatment has been helpful. Yes, and you're my friend, aren't you? Please say you're my friend, you're my friend. Do you have other friends? Not really, but you are, aren't you? So I have been your psychiatrist for a while. What would it mean if I was your friend? Patient thinks for a while that I can trust you. Do you feel you can? Patient thinks for a while, yes, but you still like to have a friend. And this opened the door to talk about some of the patient's negative symptoms and lack of, of socialization. And we see this very, very often, symptoms and secondary gain. This is an outpatient with schizophrenia, very bright uh, young woman with delusions about telepathy. And she had been seen every three months for 30 minutes for two years. And she was seen for most of that time not wanting to take any medications. And she just started taking medications three months ago. I had one of those aha moments. My aunt called me. She said she had been meaning to call me for several years. So what do you make of it? I realized I couldn't have been communicating mentally with her all this time. How do you feel about that? You know I haven't been wanting to give up the people in that other world. I feel sad. You miss them. And your boyfriend? Boyfriend had died two years before patient became psychotic. Yes. Is there any silver lining to this? Well, maybe I can get out of my shell and make some friends in this world. Countertransference. You have to address countertransference. This is an outpatient, and this is the last example, with OCD seen for many years, for 30 minutes every three months. Patient walks in and says, I was afraid you wouldn't see me. Tell me, I said some bad things last time. And the, the psychiatrist starts to feel angry. You talked about obsessions regarding gays being killed by mass murderers and how you approved. The psychiatrist has a, a child who's queer. Yes, that was hateful. You think, says the patient worrying. And since then, you thought I would stop seeing you. Have you felt like that before? When I talked about leftist guerrillas in South America, you thought I would stop seeing you. Just briefly, I don't know what you think. And you think that if, you, if I told you what you think, what I think, I would, I would not want to see you. So in conclusions, having a psychiatric diagnosis and being prescribed psychotropics have meaning. Meaning will affect behavior and it'll affect insight and compliance. The psychiatrist can address this in the medication, check set, medication checking setting. However, a therapeutic alliance must be developed and sustained. The clear boundaries that go, come along with a therapeutic alliance will permit you to use transference and countertransference to understand the meanings. And that's it. I want to thank Dr. Rochelle Lenrud, who over the last two years read this book uh, along with me and was very helpful in helping me clarify some of these ideas. And now I have questions. I'll, I'll take questions if we have time. Can you hear me? All right.
Hey, Dr. Pistu, thank you so much for outstanding presentation. Will, uh, can, can you comment a little bit about your um, understanding of kind of um, how trainees have embraced this over your years as supervising in the outpatient clinic? So they haven't. <laughs> But I just became much more involved in supervision uh, lately. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm starting, I, the truth is I'm just starting to bring it up over the last couple of years, two or three years. Yeah. Um, I've had more time to think about it. Um, and uh, it, but it's not easy. I mean, I, I really think I may be like I, I did when I trained that, you know, psychodynamically oriented psychotherapy is, is done in person it, with just one on one when you have time to do therapy with the patient. And the medication checkup setting is a completely different setting, and it's not worth trying to struggle to integrate these. Thank you. Yeah. Warms my heart, Juan. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yes, Jonathan. Hey, Juan, that was fantastic and really valuable. Um, I, a long time ago, I came across uh, two questions that I try to use to get access to the fears and fantasies that patients, including people in the ACT team, have about medication. So I asked them about what would a perfect medicine, I, pre I prepped them saying there isn't a perfect medicine, but what would a perfect medicine do? And so I think that question gets at the meanings related to fantasies, you know, it'll make me, you know, superhuman, all those things. And then the opposite question gets at the fears that I think a, any patient will have about medication. So I said, what would a perfect medicine not do? And I think I always write it down. And then when I, um, once they're on the medications, at some point I'll I'll refer back to it and say, this is what you, said you hoped the medicine would do and hoped it wouldn't do. And how does this medicine compare? So I think it's one way of getting access to meanings, yeah. fantasies, and fears that the medicines, that patients have of medicines. Yeah, I, that, that sounds like a, like a keeper. Any, any other questions or comments? Any comments are fine. Any of the residents or other faculty? Just, just speak. I mean, I, hi. So, um, Dr. Busio, I know you said that you haven't, but you know, at least you said that in the last couple of years, you've, you've really brought this up, but I think you've been very influential in my training, um, thus far. And, and I think you have, keep hammering in these, these concepts. And, and I, I think it's really kind of getting somewhere with our residents, um, at least for myself. But I'm really glad um, you presented this book during Grand Rounds, and I've, I've really enjoyed reading it and kind of discussing it with you. Um, and just like the idea of thinking about psychodynamic psych psychotherapy, like utilized in our in, in our medication management management appointments, I think that the thought that we can't think about it or it's just a checklist is completely false. And so I really love how that book kind of brings it in like just we can we can always use it we can always think about it and always become a better psychiatrist so thank you yeah and i mean i, I these are, i mean you and you have been trained for years on these skills and these are really critical skills and most of us are going to be seeing patients not in long term psychotherapy yeah most of our patients but but thinking that those skills that you you should you can just sort of drop them that they don't have an application that they're not useful, I think it's a, it's it's sad, uh, and I think it, at this stage of your career for for your residents you really need to keep in mind how can I integrate and and what that's what the beauty about about this concept of psychiatric psychopharmacology which seems like an oxymoron yeah that that gives you an avenue to legitimately pursue this. It's very easy to say, well, no, I'm just going to do uh, evidence-based medicine and that's it. And, you know, I'm all for that. But these are skills, yeah, that we developed as psychiatrists and, and we shouldn't dismiss them. 
Uh, uh, Abdel, Aziz, do you, did you have, were you waiting? Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, that was wonderful, Dr. Bastillo. Thank you so much. And David Mintz is here actually today in the ground rounds. So shout out to him. Um, I'm wondering, can you speak a little bit about ways that engaging with the meaning of medication can potentially like promote adherence or have, have you have you done any of that or, or what would that look like in severe mental illness? Like understanding like maybe a patient's uh, reluctance to take medications, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry, you're asking me? I yeah. see Dr. Mintz and I'm, 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 I'm delighted that, that you're here. Hi, Dr. Mintz. Um, so, so I, I mean, I, I, I got distracted by <laughs> seeing Dr. Mintz here. So what, what is your question again, Aziz? Uh, just a general question about addressing like the meaning of medications to, to potentially kind of promote adherence. Like, I mean, that, that, that is, that's what the whole book is about. That's, that's really what the whole book is about. And, and it's, it, the meaning is going to be different for different patients. And they're going to, there's going to be a layer of meanings. Yeah. And you need to be, you know, starting with, with serious mental illness, patients are going to have limited insight, certainly patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So that's a given. Yeah, they do not believe they have any of this. There's a much more likely explanation for these experiences. Yeah. And then, of course, taking medication. Nobody likes to take medication, but why take medication if I do not believe I'm ill? And then the medication only helps so much for many patients. Yeah. And then medication has all these side effects. And, th and then there's all these um, um, a embedded stigmas about medication and diagnosis. I mean, so th there's just so much. There's not just one meaning or two meanings or three meanings. There's a, a panoply of meanings, yeah, that you have to be, that's why you need to set the stage so that you can keep exploring that throughout the whole time that you're seeing your patient. That is part of seeing a patient in the so-called humble medication checkup um, appointment. Well, I have a question. Sure, Gerardo, hi. Hi. So as you know, my background is more in CBT. I'm just curious why it's called psychodynamic. I mean, in CBT, we do something similar. We're looking at meaning. We look at it, we use different terms, you know, maybe automatic thoughts, beliefs. Yes. So why is it called psychodynamic? Well, I, I think it's called, I mean, it's Dr. Mintz coined the term psychodynamic. And uh, I, I think it stems from looking at meaning in the context of a the symptoms, um, uh, so, so the patients being unaware, the, the, the idea that the unconscious, of course, is, is very important to psychopathology, yeah? And that you can, you don't know what, what's the underlying meaning, the unconscious meanings, but you wanna set the stage from the beginning so that you can explore that with the patient. So there are all these basic, um, uh, norms or or guidelines within psychodynamic psychotherapy about you know establishing the frame, uh, dealing with transference, dealing with uh, counter transference, all these things that are there's a lot of that 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 is part of cognitive behavioral therapy too, but I think this approach is richer than just the cognitive behavioral therapy approach. Uh, I try to integrate cognitive behavioral skills uh, into my, my regular practice. But the fundamental psychodynamic posture of you know, defining a frame, sticking with a frame, keeping boundaries, and working on using the, the, the great situation, the privilege that the patient is, starts to ex uh, develop trans The staff in the hospital, yeah, and just like they were angry towards their landlord and why they ended up in the hospital, that that small experiment you can treat it as a CBT experiment is just so powerful and rich that that uh, I think psychodyna a psychodynamic approach, especially especially good at allowing you to use that. Any other questions? Dr. Mace works, uh, wrote something in the chat. 
Dr. Mintz, you you have a question? You no, have a I, I was just making you? the point. No, I was just in the chat. I was just uh, addressing Dr. Villarreal's statement that you could also. I think the key is that we need to be making meaning. It's just that my my tools are psychodynamic, so that's how it got that term. And and I also wanted. Uh, in the context of feeling that psychodynamics was kind of embattled, wanted to demonstrate its utility to every psychiatrist. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Perla, you you had a you wanna? Yeah. Perla? So go ahead. Perla. I'm just I'm just curious if if. The way, like knowing that the therapeutic alliance is so important and that PES could be traumatic for a lot of people, how can we apply this in the same way, like in a very short encounter? Well, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, a, that's a very good question. And that's one of the things that with serious mentally ill people, we have to be very upfront about that. And it's tricky. It's a skill that you have to develop to feel comfortable with. You're getting the patient to open up, to tell you about all these very disturbing, scary experiences, stigmatizing experiences, and they're very afraid about their autonomy. And you have to convey to them, in the, if not in the first, in the second visit, that you know that sometimes people feel so overwhelmed by some of these experiences that they think about giving up on life. Have you ever felt like that? And you need to explore it. And that should lead to, well, what do you think could would happen if you felt like that? And that should lead to what do you think other people have done? What has your mom done? Uh, what, has you, what did your other doctor do? And eventually you will have to tell the patient under some circumstances, I may need to fill a certificate of evaluation and uh, get an officer to bring you to the emergency setting Again, and how do you feel about that? And but before the end of the session, you should be able to say, say we talked about this. You got somewhat quiet after I, I mentioned that I might be able, I might have to fill a certificate of evaluation. What do you think? All right. Comments. Well, Dr. Bastillo, I know we only, we, we, at the end of our time. Academia. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Dr. Bastillo. I know we have very little time, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to show my gratitude to you for not only for this excellent talk, but also to comment on um, your generosity as far as teaching learners across multiple settings, staying involved in both the psychiatric emergency service, as well as inpatient work, as well as outpatient work and clozapine clinic. And I, I can tell you that very regularly, I have medical student learners, and I also hear from residents too, who comment on learning so much from watching your modeling and from your direct teaching as well, modeling these very concepts. So particularly with interviewing and establishing rapport with patients. So thank you for your, for your work and contributions. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you, Debbie. Well, I think we've run out of time. And so I, I will stop now and have a good evening and a good weekend.